So, uh, fourth year at Skydog Con. Uh, you guys probably know me if you've been here before. My name's Curtis. I talk every year on something completely non-technical. Um, if you haven't seen it before, you can go on YouTube and see all the stuff I've done in the years before. Uh, the first year I was here, I talked about uh, neurobiology of decision making, knowing where your towel is, basically how to handle stress situations. Uh, year two, I talked a lot about uh, leading change, like how to figure out stuff that really sucks and then go fix it and ways to make that happen. Last year, I gave a talk about hacking your career, basically the things you need to do to make sure you're, you're taking care of your career because nobody else does. And then this year, I've uh, titled my talk Building Utopia. Um, Sky didn't have a chance to get the, 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 the abstract in the, into the website or on the other stuff. But the bottom line is, is um, I saw a great talk by Simon Sinek, and that's where a great deal of this material comes from. Uh, he gave a talk on why leaders eat last, and we're going to talk a lot about that. And this has a lot to do with brain chemistry and how we feel about things and how we do things. But it got me thinking about what makes some communities successful, and why do other communities struggle, and why do some communities fail? And this talk by Simon really led me into that. So I'm, I'm basically re-giving his talk, but I'm going to add the bits and pieces that I'm thinking about as I went through that um, with an eye towards um, how that deals with hacker spaces and maker spaces, how you can do that in your local communities, how that even fits into businesses. We can't, this doesn't really fit into really huge large scales like the entire planet, but it does fit into things like organizations and teams and that sort of stuff. And it deals a lot with why certain people act the way they do in certain kinds of organizations. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with the same story that Simon tells. So let's go back to 2002. It's Afghanistan, and there's an A-10 pilot, and his name is Johnny Bravo. And Johnny likes to stand like this because he's an A-10 pilot, and he's cool. And he and his wingman are uh, flying above a valley in Afghanistan. Where they are, it's, it's gorgeous. The moon is out. The night is beautiful. Below them, there's some cloud cover. And below them on the ground is a special forces team making its way through the valley. And Johnny and his wingman are listening in on the chatter as this team makes its way through the valley, They're trying to make their way out of an area. And he can hear the tension. In, in the voices. So Johnny decides he's going to go take a look. He's just going to go take a look. So he points his nose down, goes down through the cloud cover, and when he pulls up, he's about 1,000 feet off the ground. And he's between two mountain ranges. He's essentially in a valley, not a very big one either. And as he's going through the clouds and he's hitting the turbulence from this storm that's happening below him, he starts to hear the Special Forces guys on the ground going, contact, contact, effective fire. They're taking fire from both sides of the valley. They're down in the middle. And Johnny realizes he, he's got a problem. So keep in mind, this is 2002. He's in an A-10. There's no ground-following radar. And they're still using maps from the Russians. This is very early in the US time in Afghanistan. So he's basically flying by the seat of his pants. Johnny sort of figures out where he is in space and begins to count out loud as he follows himself on the map to find his targets and begins to lay down suppressive fire. 1-1,000, one, 2-1,000, one, 3-1,000, 4-1,000, 5-1,000. Yanks back on the stick, heads straight up, basically loops back around and makes another pass. 1-1,000, one, 2-1,000, one, 3 1, 4-1,000, 5-1,000. He repeats this. Great danger to himself over and over until he runs out of ammo pops back up across the clouds, says to his wingman, you've got to get your ass down there. These guys are in trouble, and I'm out of ammo. And the wingman's like, I, I, I don't know if I can get down there. We've got crummy maps. I don't know what I'm going to hit. It's a valley. There's cliffs on both sides. It's a nice plane, but planes don't do so well when they hit mountains. Johnny talks him into it and says, look, I'll go with you. Literally, three feet apart, wing to wing, they head back down again. And Johnny counts out 1, 1,000, 2, 1,000, 3, 1,000, 4, 1,000, 5, 1,000. And they pull back up and they come around again. Because of that action, 22 American soldiers went home that night. No casualties. It brings up the question, what is it about organizations that makes people willing to put their own lives on the line for other people? Are these people made? Are they born this way? And the answer is they're not. 
They're a product of their surroundings. They're a product of the organizations they come from. We have a really strange reverse incentive in the corporate world. In the military, we give medals to people who are willing to sacrifice themselves so others may gain. In the corporate world, we give you a bonus when you sacrifice other people so you can make more money. It's a little odd. It doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense. And that begs the question of which one do you want to work in? Do you want to work in the organization where you know the guy or girl in the cubicle next to you has your back? That when you take that risk, that they're going to back you up, that your boss is going to back you up because you're doing the right thing? Or do you want to work in the place where they might can you just to make an extra bonus? We've all been probably places like that where you know your boss doesn't have your back. That leads to some very interesting things. Um, think about the fact that we often don't like to give up credit for stuff. You know, how many, how, how many of you work places where your boss is taking credit for something you worked on? Hey, nice set of hands. That's, it's not an uncommon thing. The reality is that, as I've said many, many times, we are the human animal. We are the mostly hairless monkeys. We are primates. Whether you like to admit it or not, you are a primate. You're a mammal covered in mostly hair that gives live birth, and females have mammaries to feed said live birth. It's what we are. It is part of how our brains are structured. And we are motivated primarily by a set of chemicals that cause us to be these social animals. They are endorphins and dopamine, which are sort of selfish chemicals. They're things you can give to yourself very easily. And then serotonin and oxytocin are more social chemicals. And we're going to go, we're going to take a good deep dive into this. Um, these chemicals are the things that give us the feelings that we have about things, They're either good or bad. In this case, these are, these are all sort of good things, and we're going to talk about them. The first one's endorphins. Endorphins are great. How, anybody here a runner? I got one runner back there. You ever had a runner's high? That's these guys. Endorphins are fabulous at masking physical pain. They're really, really good at it. And they come from our Paleolithic caveman era. If you think about it, what this does is give you great endurance. We can then hunt animals for a very long time, kill that animal, drag it back to the cave, share it with the group. These give us that um, good feeling of doing that. It's why you, it's, it's, it's that, yeah, I'm going to go hunting again tomorrow, or I'm going to go running again tomorrow, because you have this great feeling. Um, these chemicals come out when you laugh. Laughing produces endorphins. Why? Because when you're laughing, you're actually squeezing up your internal organs in a convulsive manner. <laughs> you're, actually you're actually hurting yourself. That's why you go, no, no, stop, that hurts, because the endorphins wear off. You you're hurting yourself. But there, it's a great chemical for reinforcing the idea that I can go out and do this good thing for the social group and have some reward for it. It's why you want to go do it. It's why runners want to run more. You know, they'll go out and run 26 miles and destroy themselves. At the end of the race, they hurt like hell. And two weeks later, they're ready to run another marathon because that feeling is so good. The second major chemical is dopamine. If you've ever had that feeling of accomplishment, that you got something done, it's this chemical coursing through your brain. This chemical is the chemical for to-do lists, accomplishment. It's a uh, we get stuff done chemical. It, 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 it drives you to get it done. And in fact, without it, we wouldn't eat. Um, when you eat, you get dopamine. It's also, um, and if you didn't have dopamine, you wouldn't have a reminder that you need to eat. It's what causes us to plan ahead for that sort of thing. So that like, let's say, you know, ancient caveman's walking along and he sees a, or apple tree in the distance. He gets a little hit of dopamine. So, hmm, he gets something to eat. He starts to move towards it. As he gets a little closer, another little hit of dopamine. Get a little closer, another hit of dopamine. Finally, you get there. Big rush. Mm, oh, I feel good. Ah, I eat the apple. I feel great. It focuses us on our goals because we want that hit. This is why when we talk about goals, we talk about them having to be tangible. If you can't see see it, if you can't write it down, you don't get the little hit of dopamine. You know, it, it's why when company goals say, I want you to do more, it doesn't really do anything. Because you say more what? And just more. 
that doesn't do it. There's got to be a tangible effect. There's got to be the vision you can see. Um, we could also talk about it, you know, when you talk about visions, do I want to be more respected? Well, respected by who? What does that, your mother? Does that matter? You know, what goal is that? When you think about great visions, think about people like Martin Luther King. I have a dream. In those words, you could see what he wanted. Or JFK talking about going to the moon for the first time. Here's what we're going to do. Here's what it's going to look like. Here's how we're going to do it. You could see that picture. It focused people into moving in a direction of a vision. And when you have that, you achieve very remarkable things. When you don't, it's when organizations flounder. So think about that. Let's just take a quick break right there. You've got two chemicals, one that focuses your attention and one that makes you feel good. Pretty nice. The cool thing is, is you can give them both to yourself just by doing things. How does that have an effect in an organization? As a leader, you can set a vision and give other people this sort of thing too. So as you're building teams and organizations and hacker spaces and thinking about what you want to get done, being vague about it like, we want to teach the world how to build stuff. It's kind of nice, but it's not specific. You might want to think about being more specific. There is a dangerous side effect here, though, that you need to be warned about. Dopamine is also released when you drink alcohol, smoke nicotine, gamble, or use your cell phone. Believe it or not, yeah. You, you, you ever get up, when you get up in the morning, you, you walk through your house with your cell phone? You carry it around with you everywhere you go? That's a dopamine addiction. When you check status updates on your social network, that is a dopamine addiction. That ding, that blip, that buzz, that hum. Ooh, I got to respond to it right now. I can't, I'm going to be there in five minutes, but I got I to gotta respond right now. That's a dopamine addiction. So yeah, your cell phone is a dopamine. So you know, there's this huge rise in ADHD and uh, diagnosis. It's like up 68%. It didn't suddenly come from nowhere. It's really not ADHD addiction. There's a, there's a run, fairly strong running theory that it's actually misdiagnosed um, dopamine addiction to technology. Think about all the young people that have that technology. They're, they're constantly driven by that ding, that bip, that buzz to get something done. And you know, it causes a a frontal lobe disorder. ADHD is really a frontal lobe disorder. You're telling me that 68% of people suddenly have a frontal lobe disorder, didn't have it before? Pretty freaking unlikely. The reality is it causes a multitasking. You think you're better at multitasking. The reality is you're better at being distracted. That's why they crash their cars. You know, it's, they're not better at it. This is also where performance addiction comes from. That's why, you know, banks, they give those bonuses. Addiction to dopamine will cause you to use up your resources ineffectively and destroy relationships. Hello, have we not seen banks do this? Have we not seen companies do this? Enron did this. They were so focused on hitting some goal, whether that was real or not, that they destroyed everything they had. The good news is dopamine can be balanced by the other two chemicals that are out there. We're going to get to them in a minute. So part of organizations is understanding, again, the past, that paleolithic us. And in the past, there was a lot of danger out there, whether it was saber-toothed cats or the weather or lack of food or whatever it was. There is constant outside danger. So these chemicals are part of what caused us to be social animals because if we bond together and we work together, we can make this nice little circle and keep the danger on the outside. This is what makes us feel safe is when we can protect each other. These chemicals help reinforce the idea that, oh, you, I'll do this thing for you, and when I'm asleep at night, you'll watch my back so when the saber-toothed cat comes, I don't die. If you have internal danger, it's when you destroy this. It's when we have infighting amongst our teams, amongst our groups, that you lose that, and then you start expending energy to protect yourself, and the group falls apart. You've all probably had the experience of really horrible customer service. That partly comes from this. Those people are not protected from above. They're not in this circle of safety to be able to make the customers feel good. How far we extend that circle is a really important idea here. I'm going to talk more about it, but for, suffice for now, this is just, I'm, I'm, I want to plant this in your mind that this circle is where we feel safe. It can be an inner circle of just your execs, or it can be a circle that's pushed all the way out to the lowest member of your organization. 
So as we think about the next few pieces, think about that circle. and Think about how you bring people into that circle, whether that be a hacker community, a makerspace, your team at work, your company that you work for. Where the edge of that circle is, is critical to how this works. And there's a great story from the past that goes along with this. Anybody here familiar with the story of Aesop and the oxen? It's a really, really old fable from Greek time. So the story goes like this. There are four oxen, and they have an agreement. They will occupy this field that is surrounded by a very vicious lion. And what they'll do is they'll, they'll stand back to back all the time. So the four of them are always facing out. So no matter where the lion goes, it gets the horns. Ah, uh, Texas, hook them horns. Um, but the oxen begin to infight and have disagreements, and they go to different parts of the field to graze. And the lion picks them off one at a time. It's that infighting that kills us. If leaders of our groups don't make us feel safe, again, we're expending energy to make ourselves feel safe and not for the organization, not for the team, not for whatever it is you're trying to build. You're taking that energy that you could otherwise be productive with and you're saying, I'm going to protect me. And that causes the circle to get smaller or be destroyed. As leaders, and by, when I say leaders, I like to, t leadership is something you do. It's not necessarily a title you have. It is something you do. Keep that in mind as I talk about this. As leaders, we only have two decisions about the circle. Who gets into the circle, which we usually define by our values or our goals within an organization, and how big is it? Again, is this just an inner circle, or do we extend it all the way out to the outer edges? Who do we make feel like they belong? How do we give them that feeling of safety? This is the same thing with our products. I mean, we talk about, you know, I'm the most secure, or I'm, I got the most privacy. What we're trying to do there is drive that feeling of trust. It's a feeling. It's not something you can buy or tangible. You, know, you, you, you can't exchange it with money. It's a feeling that comes from these brain chemicals. And it really starts with this. This is serotonin. Serotonin is the leadership chemical. This is what makes you feel pride in yourself. It's what gives you status when you're in a group. Um, this is why public recognition, why, you know, why we have graduation ceremonies. You know, completing college, you complete the classes and pay your bills and return the crap you borrowed. That's really all college is. You know, at the end of it, you could get a nice email. Congratulations, here's your, here's your bachelor's degree. Oh, by the way, magna cum laude, thank you. Why do we have graduation ceremonies? Status. Because we want our parents in the crowd to go, oh, I love my son. Johnny did awesome. He got a, he got a degree. People can see that pride in us. And, why do we, and that lifts our, lifts our status, lifts our confidence. Those watching who are proud of us get just as much a hit as we do. Very interesting thing. There's, you've got to have other people to get part of this one. Um, the other part of this is this reinforces relationships with people recognition, even that's why recognition, even if it's stupid little plastic crap at work, gives people that status. You know, you go to conferences, oh, oh I, got, I got the little tiny crap plastic coin from DuoSec for their party. Ah! It's reinforcing that serotonin thing, that status. Um, it's why whenever you hear someone saying thank you in a speech, they thank mom and dad, or they thank the coach, or they thank somebody, because it's that secondary status. We want them to feel proud of us. You know, teams, they want to win one for the coach, because they want to get that status. Th this is what you do for others that helps get you that serotonin hit. There is a small problem with serotonin, though. You, you can trick it. Take a look at your clothes and notice how many of them have labels on it. Those labels are a symbol of status. It's why you know, the red stripe Prada on glasses or the Nike on your shoes or whatever it is, you know, the label on your pants. It's an outside display of your status. You can sort of cheat that serotonin a little bit with and show off your status even though it's not real. It's also why it wears off so quickly. There's no real relationship there to reinforce that status system. Um, and it's part of the reason why people accumulate physical goods. You know, people who accumulate lots of stuff are trying to find a way to build their status because they don't have the relationships. 
So again, think about those organizations. Are you building relationships with the people inside of it? Are you actually bringing them into the group? This, again, comes from the past. In the, uh, there's a sort of a practical problem here in the past. Um, let's imagine that I go out and I kill something and I bring it back to the cave and I throw it in the middle of the floor and everyone goes to eat. And the biggest and the strongest, of course, can go running in and elbow everybody out. Well, let's say you're the smaller, more intellectual, artsy type. You're probably going to get an elbow to the face. Because the big neanderthal guy is going to get what he wants first. This is a bad system for social groups. Um, it doesn't reinforce that sleeping thing I talked about before. If the big guy's giving you an elbow to face, you're probably not going to watch his back later when the cat comes. You're going to let the cat kill him, drag him off, and then try to do something else. That, well, that's going to destroy the group. Um, if we can have that trust, we can do really big things. Otherwise, we're sort of screwed. This is also why we have hierarchies, whether that be in our social groups, in our companies, in our teams, whatever it is, that hierarchy is, re that this serotonin is reinforcing that. We realize who is the alpha. And in the past, we, the alpha got first choice of meat and first choice of mate. The smaller ones would step back, let them go in and avoid getting an elbow to the face. They would still get something. They wouldn't necessarily get the best cut all the time or, or the most amount, but they would get something. It reinforces that social contract again. And I'm going to get back to why we allow that to happen in just a minute. But if you've ever been nervous to meet somebody, you're not the alpha. If you've ever sensed that someone else is nervous to meet you, you are the alpha. <laughs> We recognize that status. No, if you're excited to meet somebody, you're definitely not the alpha. <laughs> that feeling of excitement is the same sort of thing. Here's the funny thing is in women, this, this has a really interesting biological corollary, and this is a massive tangent. But if, when women live in a group together, their menstrual cycles all sync up. Oh, yeah, I did that. And the reason, it, of course, if you're not on the pill, here's the reason for that. We want the alpha male and the alpha female to mate and make nice alpha babies. But if the alpha female is menstruating, she's off the market. So biology has come up with a plan that if the alpha's off the market, everybody's off the market. <laughs> so you can't have that fake competition that then would destroy the group. That's why it does that, so that you, you don't destroy that group. It, that's the entire point behind it. All right, so there are advantages to being the alpha, as we've mentioned. You get your first choice of meat, you get your first choice of mate. But it comes at a cost. As the alpha, when danger comes to the door, because you got the better meat, because you have that serotonin to lift your status, you're expected to go meet the danger. That's your job. If you fail at that job, again, you crush the group. So being cognizant of when you are the alpha is an important part of this. Um, the cost of leadership is essentially self-interest. You have to give up things about yourself. If you're not willing to sacrifice the perks when the shit hits the fan, then you probably shouldn't be the leader. We all know people who want the perks but aren't willing to put in the work for the people under them. This is the core definition of what a leader is. And I said leader is an action. It's not a title. I don't care if your job title is manager. I don't care if your title is analyst. Leaders take action. They move towards the danger, not away from it. It's why we're offended when the people violate that social contract. It's why we're so pissed at the banks, because they sacrificed us for them to make more money. They sacrificed our entire freaking economy. You would have no problem giving Mother Teresa a million dollars. That's awesome. Yay! She did great things. It's why we get upset when people don't follow that social contract. So the last major chemical is oxytocin. This is a really awesome. This is, this is love and trust and friendship. This is rainbows and unicorns. This is all happy stuff. Oxytocin makes, makes that happen. It's why we feel safer being around our friends. It's why just hanging out with your friends is good. There's a good chance that the people sitting next to you aren't strangers today. You either met them in the hallway, you met them previously because you wanted to sit next to somebody you knew. It's oxytocin. 
in reinforcing that. And we get it from really interesting things, physical contact. How many of you met Jason Street, the awkward hugger? There's a reason he's so popular. Because <laughs> every time he hugs you, you're getting oxytocin. It's part of the reason so many of us don't feel so great. We're not getting oxytocin. That, you know, the running thing is you got to get 10 hugs a day. You only get three from the same person. If you're not getting that physical contact, you're not reinforcing that social contract, you're not building these things. You can also get it from shaking hands. That's, that's just as good. It's why when there's a business deal, at the end of it, if you don't, you don't shake hands or they refuse to shake hands, you feel uneasy about it. You're either not going to make the deal or... You know, it's going to fall apart later because you felt uneasy about it from the beginning. No, you know, you, you, they can agree to everything you want. No, no, I don't want to shake hands. The deal is screwed. There is this physical contact. We are social animals. We have to touch each other as part of this, whether it's shaking hands or giving a hug or whatever it is, you got to get this. The other place it comes from is human generosity. Just doing things for other people. You can't spend money on this. Money doesn't work. Um, Simon talks about in his talk, you know, if I came up here and I told you I was going to give $1,000 to paint inner city schools, you'd be like, that's nice. You want a medal? But if I tell you I'm going to give my time and I'm going to go paint inner city schools, it's like, that's awesome. I should go do that too. Because I'm giving a non-returnable commodity, time. Time is the one thing we all have that is of equal value to every person. I can't buy more of it. I can't create it, and I can't get it back once I spend it, regardless of who I am or how much money I have. Okay? It's why written letters have a bigger impact. You could invite me for dinner, and I could send you a nicely worded email the next day, or you can wait three days, and I can send you a handwritten letter. It will have a bigger impact because I took the time to do it. Think about this in your interactions at the office. We send email like crazy. Email is super impersonal. Um, I actually learned this trick from Simon. He talks about it in his talk as well. Um, he talks about someone sends you an email and it's on something important. Instead of firing an email back, walk over to their desk. Like, uh, uh, why are you here? I'm, I'm responding to your email. But it's, it, I'm, let's talk about it. So, you know, let's talk about this idea. Let's talk about this thing you want to do. But I need a paper trail. Fine. I'll go back to my desk when we're done and I'll, here's what we talked about and I'll send it back to you. Or if you can't walk to their desk, pick up the phone. Call them. You know, far too often we start sending emails and we fire them back and forth and someone gets lost in the middle and then there's a huge argument. And then you got to talk on the phone, which you could have avoided by starting there. Very simple short circuit. Yes? I think text messaging, which is why I like talking on the phone so much, but text messaging, text messaging is the same thing. It pisses me off because it's, uh, when I talk to somebody, I talk to them right then and there. Text messaging has some of the same thing. I will use text messaging for stuff that I don't need an immediate response on or I just want to fire off a quick message about. But if I need to talk to you and it's important, I call you on the phone. It's far better that way. Um, the other cool thing is by viewing acts of human kindness, we get a hit of oxytocin. So if you've ever been, you know, you've ever stood on a street corner and see someone drop something and somebody else picks it up for them and hands it back, just viewing that gives you a hit of oxytocin, much less than the two parties involved, but you get a little bit. It's part of what reinforces, again, that social contract. So if you want to reinforce a team, if you want to reinforce that feeling of safety, you go and you sit down next to that person, you have a conversation with them, you call them on the phone, you spend the time with them. You know, which, which would you rather have? Or which would you say is the better boss? That's a, that's a better way. The one who sends you an email or about the thing that is a problem or the one that shows up to your desk to help you out with it? Which one's the better leader? The one who comes to the desk, yes. Hey, you guys are catching on. Yay, I got interactivity, what I like. Yes, th if you haven't been told my talks are interactive, you just if you throw stuff, please make sure it won't hurt me. That's all I ask. Uh, I do. I get, a hit of, I get a little hit of dopamine, too, because I'm a little nervous. Oh, I'm going to get a hug. Woo! I got some status, too. Yeah. So I've already mentioned it. Time and energy. Do things in person. Take the time to build relationships. Get oxytocin. <laughs> Good things. You know, giving your time and your energy is what's going to build that circle again. 
who's going to feel safe inside of it? Now, there is one chemical I haven't talked about yet, and it's called cortisol. You ever heard a bump in the middle of the night in your house? Wake up, and you're like, <gasps> you got to go see what it is because they're visual animals. You don't find anything. You have that huff after you feel good. But, of course, what you do first is slap your partner next to you like, I heard something in the house. <laughs> Both of you are like, it's like a herd of gazelles. You know, one of them thinks they hear the lion, and Pete's looking around trying to find the, the, the lion, and Bob next to him goes, shit, Pete thinks he saw a lion. <laughs> Soon everyone's looking for the lion, and the one that sees the lion sees it and takes off, and everybody runs. Why? Because cortisol says, hey, let's shut off growth. Let's shut off non-essential stuff. It's that little feeling of paranoia, but it's that fits into that fight or flight, I got to get the hell out of here kind of feeling. But it's meant to be very short lived. The downside is if you have a really crappy job where you're feeling stressed all the time, you're getting a slow drip of cortisol all the time. It's what's making you sick. Literally, our jobs are making us sick. Yes. A good, is it video, f anytime you have that f fright, that's cortisol. So yeah, if you, you, you're there, you know, cortisol is really fun in the short term. It's why we like haunted houses. It's why we like scary movies. We don't mind a little short-term scare. But when you constantly have that little, oh man, I heard there's going to be layoffs. Now I'm worried about what's going to happen to my job. You've got that slow drip. Oh, I shouldn't have said that in that meeting last week. I'm screwed. That's cortisol. It ruins growth and it shuts down your immune system. Yeah, cortisol shuts off your immune system. Why? Because if I have to run away from a lion, having an immune system isn't so good. Being able to run faster is good. Yes? Yes, PTSD probably has a relationship to cortisol. I haven't looked into it, but I, I, would, I would suppose that it does. I mean, you're under a huge amount of stress. It's part of what makes you feel crappy when you have it for so long. Um, it, again, it's bad in the long term. For short-term hits, great chemical. It's all about survival. I got to get the hell out of here kinds of stuff. But over the long term, you're really boned. It's not going to do well for you. It's not an awesome chemical. So the bottom line is, the next move is up to you. You know, I'm going to encourage you all to go out and build some oxytocin. The good news is, remember the bad stuff about dopamine, that addiction? Oxytocin completely neutralizes that. If you're building relationships, you're counteracting the bad parts of dopamine, which then make it an effective part of an organization, that focus, that drive towards a goal. But you're doing it while you're building a relationship. You're building an organization. You're building a team. You're building a community. If you haven't read Tribes by uh, Seth Godin, it's very much on this same idea. Build your tribe of people who are similar to you and drive towards something you want to achieve. Think about where you can give service and time. And I'm going to give a little PSA here, too. Um, my, my favorite comedian of all time died this year, Robin Williams. And he died from something that is totally, in my opinion, largely avoidable with this stuff. If we have communities that care about us, if we have communities that help us get oxytocin and feel trust and value, then the things that drive the feelings that I, my only way out is suicide come from that. So I'm going to encourage everyone in this room, if you ever have that feeling, talk to someone. Pick up a phone and call a suicide hotline. Do something about it. I've lost friends to suicide. I've lost friends to depression. And I'm tired of seeing mental disease treated as a stigma in our society. So I'm going to stand up here and say, stop it. You know, be the Jason Street or the awesome gentleman here who gave me a hug. It doesn't cost a lot to give a little bit of your time to let somebody else know that you care and you want them there. And it's all for the better. Thanks. <laughs> Questions, comments, smart remarks? Yes.